Hello. Um, so, documentary. Um, it's a word I think I made up. Um, maybe not. Uh, but really, it's about my approach to how I go about doing my job. Um, it's about getting everyone who you work with invested in quality, uh, quality products with quality docs. Um, and I'll go into a little bit of why I think this is important, and then a few of the things that I do to uh, try and get my organization to really love the docs. Uh, so I'll start with a little bit of history about myself. Make sure this is all working. Okay, so I started my career out of university at IBM. Um, I started as a web designer just after the dot-com crash. So they quickly made me a, a document writer. Um, the rule of thumb at IBM for the 14 years I was there was about one writer for every uh, 10 engineers. And that meant I worked in a, uh, a team of writers on some of their uh, big enterprise software that was pushing 40, 50 years old. Um, at some point last year, around 18 months ago, I left IBM and I joined a startup where I was one writer in a room of about 25 engineers, um, which seemed about normal from speaking to other people around the community that had... Um, that was working in that ecosystem. Um, I left there after a year, and at my current company, I'm the sole writer and about 50 engineers. I use the term engineers slightly loosely. That is development, test. There's some configuration uh, guys at our team. There's support guys that have hands-on uh, work with the docs. Um, so I caveat that with a niche. It's a gut feeling. Um, so why do I think this has happened? I think that there's been a lot of factors that's contributed to the, the change in the, the ratio of us working. Um, the one factor is financials. The, over the last 10 or so years, the cost of developing software is consistently being driven down in some of the uh, areas that management might see as peripheral is, is getting condensed. Um, but it's also, I became more experienced. Maybe I, I can cope with the bigger workload. I'm more savvy with the technology. That might have been a reason. Um, the, also, industry changes. When I first started at IBM, it was very much a waterfall style of development. And becoming agile meant that we could do stuff faster. Uh, but I think it's the amount of collaboration has changed. When we were a waterfall team, we got a big spec doc from the, from the architects and the development team, and we said, okay, you've got six months to turn that into user content. Uh, now, we're a little bit more embedded. It's much more of an organic process. I believe this is at the heart of documentary. It's that question of uh, how much content can you produce? Well, I'm not being asked to deliver five times the amount that I was when I first started IBM. Um, my role now is much more of a curator. I'm inheriting content from all over the business, and I am making sure it has that voice and tone, and uh, it is the, the way that we will present our, our materials to our users. The, the volume of what I'm doing and actually writing myself is much lower than it was when I first started. So if I can be an effective curator and I'm not so much as being a prolific creator, how is that benefiting me and the company? If I was in a situation where I was having to generate five times the content that I was when I was first starting, that has overhead in itself. The, you need people to review all this stuff. It needs to be published and maybe translated. Um, you need consumers that want five times the volume that I could, could have produced. Um, the, as the role has changed to being more of a curator, I have extra responsibilities than I had in the first place. Now I look a lot into automating documentation builds. 
save overhead there. I look at um, testing the docs so that I'm not having to go back through lots of old material, making sure it's still up to date. We can integrate a lot of our tests and we get told when the, when the docs are breaking. Um, and single sourcing. The, a lot of the, the content, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, is the, the, the copy that we're producing for uh, our user guides was being very similar to the content that we were putting out on our website as marketing material. Now we single source a lot of that. So we can reuse a lot of the material that we're writing. So I'm not having to generate three, four times the same content. I may be able to do it once and then we reuse it. I know this is probably not the, the ideal slide to put up in a room full of document writers, but the realization of this was quite key to me going to the next level in my career, really, that what I was really doing, I was spending most of my time trying to get information out of the heads of the people that um, were building the product. And I'd have to find a way to ask them, you know all about this, you built it, give me the information. And really, I, when I accepted, OK, they know a lot more than I do about this product. Really, that changed our relationship so that I'm not consistently badgering them to say, give me good copy, give me good something that I can use. It was just an acceptance. OK, I'll accept that you know a lot more about than this and the, about the product than I do. And then we work together because of this. Why are they the least appropriate people? They've got better things to do, and they're working to different targets. Um, they actually have to build the product. That is on the right side, yeah. They actually have to build the product. I can come at it with a different mindset and say, OK, what's, what's driving you towards your goal is on the same track as me, but I come at it from a different angle. I need to bring with it all the experiences that I know about what the user has experienced up to this point. And take that knowledge and that they have and then mold it into something that we can then give to a user that actually works for them. My goal is a much bigger picture than theirs. They're working to very specific acceptance criteria maybe or to a particular test that they're trying to get past. Whereas mine is a bigger picture. I'm looking at maybe one user, one customer, and I can bring that to our discussions and extract the information that we need. This was the kind of the milestone in, in when I was working with, with engineers, is getting everyone around us in our organization to understand that documentation is product. And you don't have one without the other. If you have one without the other, you don't have a product. Um, I've got a, uh, a couple of stories that I'll uh, use as an example. Um, that really showed how having uh, no documentation or poor documentation can affect our customers, uh, no matter how good your product is. And the assumptions that get made about your product when you, you're not paying enough attention to the docs. Ah, we all have the same goal. Um, so the two stories I'm going to provide are uh, two concurrent projects I worked on, and they both seem to be heading in the same direction, but they both had very different results. Um, the first one was a great product. It was very ambitious. It was uh, a service that was going into a cloud deployment. It had to work with lots of other services. The, it was a very, very challenging time scale. And they, the, the development team had um, really, really stringent quality uh, criteria that they had to work to. Um, but the end result was the docs weren't so good. They had a lot of challenges to overcome that meant that there was lots of changes and, and flux all around the development process. Um, we didn't have, or we didn't give enough attention to the amount of time uh, that it would take in uh, an architectural level to make sure that we pitched it to the right user, which ended up with the documentation living in the wrong place for customers to consume it. It was in the, the wrong style. It was far too dense, and it had 
uh, it made some of the, the good features of the product really difficult to use. And this was some of our observations afterwards. It was a great product in a great market space. So the, the early interest was really, really big. Installation was horrific. The, it was very complicated, but it was complicated because it kind of needed to be. It exist, the product existed in a, uh, on a platform that was integrated with lots of other products, some of them third party, some of them uh, in-house. Um, and all the feedback was, this is really, really difficult to use. All the feedback we got was negative. Everybody said, this product is unusable. Um, they weren't really getting anything back that was related to the product itself. And whether it was you know, meeting the goals and the needs of the user, it was all around, I can't do this. This doesn't work, seem to work. Um, it's not doing what you sold it to do. We found that a lot of the features weren't even used. They didn't even get that far, um, which, was the, which was the worst part of it, really. They, they had some stuff that they thought was cutting edge and would really make an impact in the market space, but it just wasn't getting to that point. And ultimately, they lost a lot of the users, the early interest users that we were going to use as kind of the lighthouse customers or the beta testing customers. While I was doing some research around this area, I found this quote on a GitHub pull request that kind of took me back to that moment when we were doing this project and some of the stuff that we didn't pay attention to and, um, and, and to a very simple solution to how we could have overcome it in that just simple testing would have shown that some of the early stuff that we had written had got so out of date. At the same time as, as, as this project, we were doing a local implementation of the same product. Um, it, running it locally, they, the reason it was happening was because internally we had some uses for it. And they said, OK, we, could, we can get some early buzz with this, and maybe it would lead into people using the cloud deployment. Um, but the, the runway for it was never that long. It was, OK, we'll get an early version up and, and, um, and, up and running. So I say flawed product, it was just a limited product. But the docs were really good because it was simple. It was local deployment. It, the installation instructions worked. We had some documentation built into the product so you could run Hello World tutorials from a tutorial inside the product. And everyone really liked that because it was quite flashy and, and it worked quite well. Um, yeah, so it was, it was easy to get up and running. And um, we, we knew it didn't have much, much runway, but the, the users that we got up on it said, yeah, it was good. All the feedback came back saying, it's really good, but I can't get to the next level, because there wasn't one. It was um, kind of what we expected it to be. And because we were getting um, all the features being used by the users and we were getting really good feedback, we had a runway for improvement. The, there was... Um, a plan that we could have put into place to take that flawed product from A onto you know, version X and, and, and beyond if we want. Ultimately, we didn't because that wasn't its purpose. But um, side by side with the other project that had lots of problems, we, it, it kind of opened our eyes to say, OK, well, we got the documentation for that right. We got it wrong for the other one. And, you, and the implications of that were quite far reaching. Um, so taking those lessons and, and moving on to the next project, well, I really had this in mind that a, a lot of the, the, the blockers that we'd had that caused us to go the wrong way in the, in, the, in the problem project was that we weren't adapting the tooling that, to allow us to be able to integrate with the development guys. They had all this knowledge. We needed to extract it. But it was a long, it was a long distance um, between getting that information and then getting it up on the page. Um, so giving ourselves the best chance to succeed, for me, was starting to use tooling that um, was common between the development teams and us as the, as the writers. Um, 
A couple of logos up here. I know Eric doesn't like Markdown, but it's the only one that I, I couldn't find a logo for restructured text, so that's why that's there. But we started to use some of the products that the development team were using. So instead of having uh, XML um, documents with um, our own bespoke builds, we started to use GitHub, and we started to use Sphinx, and we started to integrate our docs onto the uh, Jenkins uh, automated build so that, that we could integrate some tests and we knew that if they changed the API that it would break some of our docs and uh, using product like Jira to, that the development team were using to, for their organization and structure meant that we could add a button on the tickets for the developers or the architects, whoever is creating the stories to say yes, this either requires documentation, no this uh, no, this setting requires no documentation or not sure. And that would just flag up to us that we had some, uh, we could add some value really early on in the, in the development of the product. Um, so that was really um, us putting ourselves in the position to succeed where in the, that previous project we had failed because there was that um, barrier that was uh, meaning that we were one step behind or one step away from the development team. I spoke to some colleagues of mine across the years and asked them how did, uh, how did they think that um, the documentation community and industry has changed over the last 10 or so years. And nearly every one of them gave me a comment a bit like this, that the, the, it wasn't that, hey, we can put out 20% of stuff that's wrong. It was just that the, um, the focus on delivering content that was correct wasn't as important as delivering everything that was end-to-end. -end. We could handle a certain amount of information coming back saying, this doesn't work for me. Um, but what wasn't acceptable was, we, hey, we only, we only docked four out of the five features. That we had to go end-to-end -end because we were an open source company and um, or the examples that I got were from people from open source companies that said, we iterate so quick that if we don't get end-to-end, -end, then that really hurts us. But if we're only 80% correct, that we can handle that, the, you know, the, the difference, the delta between uh, the, the bits where we'll get feedback saying this doesn't quite work for us. So as I now work with lots of engineers, I can no longer see myself as an island like I might have done when I started at IBM when I was in a big team of people and we were getting big spec docs through. I can't have that mindset where I'm the only guy in the room that does my part of the work. I now have to open it up to, to say that, hey, we're all in this together, and let's find the best way to get the job done. Apologies for the horrible clip art diagrams. But really, I now sell myself as a, as a bridge between those departments, and it's not just between me and engineering. It's, it's marketing and it's sales. All of these departments have collateral of some kind that, have, that talk about the product. And my position is a bridge between all these people. There's not a great deal of communication at my current company, which is a consulting company, between the consultants that are out talking to customers and the developers that are building our back-end platform. But through me, I can be that bridge. I, can, I have one foot in that camp and I have another in, in the other way, in the other side. And I can make sure that these two teams are on the same are on the same page, and we're all working towards one goal. So there's no real secret to this. The, I've kind of found my own way. I haven't really applied a theory to it. Um, all of these examples I have seen, though. So yeah, one way to get the information and work with your engineers is persistence. It's probably quite an aggressive one, but you, if you really need some information and someone's being a little reluctant, you can just badger them until they tell you to go away and give you what you want. Um, process, I talked about using Jira to actually give a flag for when uh, work is being worked on that has impact on documentation, and that's worked really well for me. Um, uh, events I've seen used really well, workshops and um, one thing that worked really well when we did, we were kind of a, an island and 
seen as a periphery was, um, they called it a paper jam, it was where it's kind of like an amnesty on the docks and people could write, we had a whole day of reviewing and feedback and ideas and, and things like that, that worked really well. I've seen that as well. I've seen, I've seen people storming out of meetings and, and uh, throwing wobblers. One, one good example is um, the, the lead documents, documentarian on a, a project. Uh, it was a release meeting and he wasn't invited and he threw himself into the meeting and threw a right tantrum and he actually did get the release stopped because the docs weren't up to standard. Donuts work. If you want someone to do something for you that they're a bit reluctant to do it, you can just turn up at their desk with some donuts and what might be an informal chat turns into really valuable for yourself. Um, but what I think has really made me effective in my role is what's made me good as, as a writer is that I can empathize with the user. I can put myself in a position where I can make all the make all the assumptions to say, okay, I've, I've got to this point. This is what I've experienced so far. This is what my goal is. And empathize with that person so I really feel it and I know what the, their, their expectations are. And it's true on the other side that if I put myself in the position of someone who has information that I need, I can work out how the best way to approach them is. I can choose what method I use, whether it's uh, a chat Slack or email or some other, some other form, or maybe it's this person only really responds when you get them sat down in a face-to-face -face meeting. <coughs> this person doesn't like to be disturbed. This person's okay with it. So if my, my one takeaway is, is just if you'd approach it with, that, with the empathy of working out what, what is the best way to work with someone, that's generally the best way because there's no one rule that's really worked. You know, I've, I've seen all of these things work quite well, and I've probably seen them all work quite badly as well. But the one way that is, is true is that you get, um, is if you can really appreciate what that person needs at that given time, then you can be successful. And that's it. I think I finished a few minutes early. Um, if anyone wants to talk about it, I'll be having a beer later. Thank you very much.